Our next speaker just got back from a three-month solo expedition in the Pacific Northwest. Pretty cool, huh? She's an outdoors woman, survival expert, and she can give you a great recipe for slug fajitas. True. We did the badge. She specializes in wildlife DNA and evidence collection. She's affiliated with the Olympic Project and the BFRO. How about a big hand for Shelly Covington, Montana? Thank you. Um, my name is Shelly Covington, Montana. I'm a native Texan. Um, most of you probably don't know me. Um, I travel all over the U.S looking for the great North American Sasquatch. How lucky are we that we have this enigma that lives in our, in, on our continent. So anyway, my, um, I'm from a law enforcement family. My father is a retired state narcotics lieutenant. When I started all of this, um, it was through the idea, or well, through my husband's experience that he had talked about for over 20 years, and I couldn't figure out what he was talking about because it happened here in Texas. Um, when I finally figured out, he was telling me that he had a Sasquatch encounter without actually saying it. I was on a mission. Uh, I'm a wilderness enthusiast, um, but with that and my husband's encounter and my father's law enforcement background, I'm motivated through facts, not emotions. And that's what this, this whole presentation is about today. Um, like I said, I just came back from a three month uh, expedition event in the Pacific Northwest. I drove across the country by myself and spent a lot of time, a lot of money, looking for something that's important to me. And I wanted, Bigfoot is bigger than any of us. It's important to me. And I want to bring back only facts and teach those who are interested in that. If, if I know there's people here that probably just want an encounter. Of course we all do, but what I think is important is proof. And I like to say, pro proof is truth. So, when this all started, I got on the internet, the World Wide Web, and this is the kind of stuff I was starting to find. Um, who here has had these kind of pictures sent to you? A couple. Um, this is a proof, this is emotion. A lot of people in, um, on Facebook, particularly, uh, are more interested in the experience than the facts, and that isn't what I'm about, that I, I think Bigfoot deserves better. So, if you send me a picture with circles, I'm probably gonna put X's on it and send it back. It may be interesting, but it's not, it's not what we need. It's not what we're looking for. What I'm interested in is the attention of one scientist. If I can get the attention of one scientist, I might be able to get the attention of two or three. And then we might be on our way. We might be on the right path. That's what I'm interested in and that's what I think many people are interested in. Um, what I was finding also on the internet was many believers are also bringing in fringed ideas about Bigfoot. So, not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with that, but a lot of times that's what people like to call as evidence, is their ideas of what Bigfoot does, or where Bigfoot comes from, or why Bigfoot is here. That's not what I'm interested in. That's not going to help us. That's not going to put you on the right path. It's interesting and it's fun, but it's not evidence. It's not proof. I like to say Bigfoot research went to hell when insanity met the internet. If you look back in history, 
before we had the internet, Bigfoot didn't cloak, Bigfoot didn't ride on UFOs, Bigfoot didn't do mind speak, those kind of things. If that's what you're interested in, that's fine, but that's not Bigfoot evidence. The next thing I started looking for was what was actually possible evidence. What really could give us a good grasp on what we needed to look for and how we needed to go about it. Um, what I was seeing is people would do videos or pictures and they would have what they thought was Bigfoot hair or other kinds of evidence and it would be, you know, just basically them holding a piece of hair saying this is Bigfoot hair, I know it is, and my response will was, well, why don't you just lick it at that point? I mean, you're going to contaminate it. It's not doing anybody any good. It's not helping any of researchers that really want to go out and find facts and, and help the community as a whole to figure out, are we on the right track? We all, you know, either have a belief or if we've seen one. It's important to a lot of us people to have proof. and. This wasn't helping, and I thought to myself, okay, what would my dad do? What would he tell me? And he would say, Shelly, come back with the facts. How can I do that? So I started looking into wildlife DNA kits because I didn't even want to call them Bigfoot DNA kits or look into that because then it's purposely focused on Bigfoot. My agenda was how can you call it Bigfoot if you've not researched everything else around Bigfoot? So, Bigfoot lives in the forest, it's a wildlife um, entity, so let's look into the wildlife aspect of it. Um, then I started finding out that wildlife DNA kits were extremely expensive, anywhere from $200 to $500, and they were People like us, people like me, I can't afford that. But I wanted to bring back facts so that my dad would say, yeah, this is what my daughter does, and she has facts. Um, but I also was learning that with wildlife DNA kits, I could create them through the medical community at a lower expense, and I could set up a few guidelines with the medical community, that's who I got involved with, and it would, it would teach me more about wildlife in general than just Bigfoot because I started collecting things just on its own. And it didn't matter what kind of hair it was. Oh, there's bear hair. Let's see what, it, what, what it's about. Let's see what it looks like. It became more than what I expected. The, the really interesting thing about the, the kids in general was I would hand them out at expeditions that I was invited to, and I would have some people who would be super interested and would ask me to explain how to use the kit, what they were for, and then I would have people that would just toss them aside. It really told me who I wanted to research with and who I wanted to just be friends with. Now, the kids that I have created are in their fourth generation. They are up to human standards. So, you actually have everything is um, up to medical grade. So, you're not going to have any issues with contamination. Um, also, they're lightweight. I put them in a plastic bag so they're weatherproof. Um, and you should always have it. One great thing about the kits in general is there is a swab that you can use as a buccal swab. When you're collecting any kind of evidence, be it casting, DNA, hair evidence, you should always video. Pictures are great, but you can pull pictures out of video. Video is going to give more of a three-dimensional uh, aspect to how you're collecting it, if you're contaminating it, um, there is an, actually a swab, the one with the little red top on it, that you can do a buccal swab with. Because haven't we all heard about 
uh, human DNA contamination with possible Bigfoot evidence. This way, if you, number one, video yourself as you're collecting, and also, just as um, a side note, I have placed two face masks and two pair of gloves and sanita uh, sanitary napkins for um, two different people so you can have an assistant. And um, But video yourself, do a buccal swab, send that in if you have that DNA. I also put in, in the kits um, Cindy Dosen, who I work with at the Olympic Project, who will do hair analysis, give you a full report, and she does it for free. Um, so we're re really appreciative of her. Um, she helped us out with the hair analysis from the Olympic Project nesting site, which I've been there a couple times. It's pretty cool. But always have your casting material, your DNA kit in your pack, so that if you're in, you need to practice these things. Um, I, I know a lot of people carry a lot of equipment, but how many times do you actually practice with it? I mean, we always always are waiting for that time to use it. I go out and I practice. I'm always looking for something to practice with. And here we go. Practice, practice, practice. This is a picture of myself at the Olympic Project nesting site. And I collected a lot of hair. Uh, and I've, I've sent off the hair for analysis from another um, person that can, you know, give us another insight. I think it's important not to send your um, samples off to one person, but at least three. Um, basically, DNA collection or hair collection is easy. Just treat it like it's a bala. If you treat it like it's something that you don't want to touch, you're going to collect it correctly. And in these kits, they give you, it, there's everything that you could possibly need for any kind of collection from scat to blood to um, hair, bone, I guess if it's small enough. Um, and um, I also include a list of the ways to store the DNA for you. Um, this is a cool thing that you can do as far as practice or possibly um, finding something of a um, suspect is bird's nest. Um, I was in a camp um, in the Cascades this summer and had uh, gone off to do some gold panning during the low times of the day. And when I came back, there was a bird's nest that had fallen out of a tree in our camp. And I decided, let's just deconstruct this and see what kind of hair, or if there is any, in the nest. If you go about your research, trying to practice and collect things that are what you wouldn't necessarily think are um, of importance, you might find that there are an importance in there. This nest, when I deconstructed it, had all kinds of hair. It had ungulate hair, it had uh, rodent hair. Um, we actually found, I think it was three hairs that were over six inches long. Now, I'm pretty sure they're gonna come back as elk hair, but who knows? It gives you practice, and it also keeps you in that mind sight of always looking for something to possibly give you a different aspect on what we're actually looking for. You know, you never know what you may find. And um, this was really interesting and fun. There's some other things you could do, like if you possibly had an encounter, say you saw a Sasquatch behind a tree, you can also go over and collect all the debris off the ground throw it into a regular trash bag, shake it, lay it in the sun so that it creates static electricity, and if there is any hair in that debris, it will, it will cling to the sides of the bag, uh, open the bag, you know, cut the bag open, and collect your hair. Send it off to Cindy Dosen, she'll be happy to analyze it for you, and what's even more awesome about all of this is 
going through these types of steps and procedures have actually had people come up with finding wildlife that was thought to not exist in that region, but actually are existing there. So even though we're out to do Bigfoot research or Sasquatch research, there's other things that are actually showing up. And I think that's exciting. And I think it teaches us and it gets us motivated and it puts us in the right mindset. Um, you can also set up something called um, tape traps just for practice. So say you see a ground squirrel or a chipmunk, take regular scotch tape or duct tape and make little um, traps around their den. So when they come and go, they will actually leave hair on those traps and you can pull the hair, look at it under just a, a really simple microscope. It, it doesn't have to be expensive, but start to teach yourself. Become an experienced researcher in at least one thing that you love doing. Make yourself an expert. I mean, we're considered what I call, or what has been the new norm, citizen scientist. I don't have a degree, but I'm trying really hard to live up to those expectations. So things like deconstructing a bird's nest or setting up tape traps, those things really, really do matter. And I actually had a, a, a scientist, a, a primatologist that um, connected with me and she said, Shelly, these kind of things are helping with our work because we do look at that. So, you know, we're not just looking for Bigfoot, we're actually learning about wildlife in general. How do you know if it's Bigfoot if you don't know what he lives with, right? So, Sasquatch for dummies. Of course, no one in here is dumb. But as far as Sasquatch research, I think we're all on the dumb side. I mean, it's even though we're in the 50th year of the Patterson-Gimlin film, we still are very limited on the actual evidence and facts that we have. Um, so we're all like infants or, or juveniles, I guess, you know, in this, in what is fact, what is evidence. Um, there's no experts in Sasquatch, y'all have all heard that, I'm sure. Um, but one thing that that I, I really try to do, and the people I work with that I feel are very close to me, that I work with a lot of people. I've, I've been everywhere from the nesting site to the kill site to, I'm the first woman at the Ape Canyon event. But what I really look for is people that are mentally disciplined, who really keep emotion out of the research. You know, you want your friends to tell you, no, that's not Bigfoot. I mean, if it's not, it's not. And I think that's important. I think Sasquatch in general deserves that. I mean, it, it, it doesn't get us anywhere if we're not on that path. Um, being mentally disciplined is extremely important to me, and I think it's important to a lot of people. And that is the one thing I think will get the attention of science. Um, also, don't let others pollute your thoughts on, or common sense. Um, an example of this is I've, ha I've had two experiences that I believe, and I quote, believe were Bigfoot. I did see the creature, it, but it was at night. It was on a blue moon. And then six days later, I went back to the same location and had large well, not large, um, golf ball sized rocks and sticks thrown at a tree next to my tent and it woke me up at five o'clock in the morning and went on for 30 minutes. I believe that was Sasquatch evidence because of all that I did after. But um, during the event, the first event, I was with someone else and we were both experiencing the event. Um, what I told him after we saw what we thought we saw, I asked him, please don't talk to me anymore. I simply need you to draw what you saw because I do not want you to pollute my ideas because it's great to um, have your friends and people that you trust around you. Did you see that? Did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. 
and then it becomes something maybe that it wasn't. So for me, what I, I did was ask him to draw what he saw the next day. I also did the same thing, and we came out with the same drawing. So that was more important to me than hearing what his words were. If you go about your research like that, it helps you to discount all other things because Bigfoot should always be last. You as a researcher, in my eyes, it's important for, if, if you're going to send me something, I would really like to know how you go about it. And um, things like that really just step it up a notch. It, it gets us closer to actual proof. Be detail-minded, detail-minded, detail-minded. Do your research and then do your research again. Do not lead your research with emotion. Emotion, I think, is one of the biggest problems we have. It's great to believe in Bigfoot. Um, okay. Um, discount everything first. Bigfoot is always last. Stay away from Facebook. Facebook is a great place, but not for Bigfoot research. Stick with the facts and have fun. Um, go When you start your research, go in and look for reports in different locations. Go to the TBRC, the BFRO, and there's many other resources online. Sorry guys, I need to wrap this up. Um, historical resources are great. Old newspapers, locals, Native Americans, read anything that was written by John Green, John Bitternagel, Grover Kranz, Renee de Hinden, Peter Byrne, and Dr. Meldrum. Internet can be very useful, but be very careful. Um, wildlife sounds, those are the most important. We all go into the woods and hear, you know, all kinds of things going on around us. If you go to the Cornell University, they have the largest archive of natural sounds and wildlife sounds that you can listen to. Topographical maps, those are fantastic. Look for new logging areas. Look um, at Google Earth for connections of waterways and head headwaters. Get into the woods, that's the most important thing. When you go into the woods, it's like throwing a pebble into the ocean and you have waves. Go into the woods, sit down, and be quiet for 30 minutes. It takes about that long for everything around you to actually start to um, come back to norm. Uh, observe natural sounds and occurrences, look for food sources, look for waterways and natural springs, and most importantly, have a good time. Um, equipment, audio recorders always carry two, that's what I do, throw one out as soon as you get there, carry the other one on yourself in case anything happens. Cameras are great, don't put it up to your face, try to take pictures from the chest area, um, and hex suits, come and see me and I'll talk to you about that. Um, castings. I think uh, Cliff went over castings. Those are super important. Cast everything. Practice, practice, practice. All kinds of wildlife. Practice um, video and always video yourself during the process. No matter if it's casting, DNA collection. Um, put your video camera near the ground. That way it will get a three dimension of your uh, impression on your track. Um, always have casting material on you. I always have it in my car or in my tra in truck Norris. Uh, and take measurements of everything. Um, also put um, all these pics on video and document, 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 document. Uh, basically this is my protocol when I go into the woods. I'm always looking for new logging areas. I bring a skeptic with me which is very, come see me about that. I act like a dumb, dumb camper. I uh, love going into cold camp, meaning no fire, no light. I immediately put out a recorder. Um, you can use FLIR night vision cameras and those such things, but it's not needed. Um, be loud. I find the best experiences are uh, when you're just, not out looking for Bigfoot, you're just out doing your thing. Be loud, bring attention to yourself. Um, 
use red light, try not to use white light. For whatever reason, people believe that's a good thing, and I'm all, I'm all about that. Video yourself collecting anything that might be evidence, including tracks, impressions, and castings. Document everything and always, always be prepared. Sp uh, suspect activity recordings, um, check with internet sources, Cornell University. Um, if you get a recording, you can contact David Ellis or Chris Spencer with the Olympic Project, and they can put it on a spectrograph and um, see if it's anything of interest or something else. Just count everything else. Audio is the worst. Rock clacks, come see me about that. I have a story, collective um, activity, not just one. Bigfoot will always be last. Most possible is most probable. That's important. Um, if it's the most possible thing, is probably the most probable thing that's going on. It's probably not Bigfoot. That's how I look at it. Um, Getting the attention of a scientist. I told you about that. I think proof is truth. It's worthwhile. Bigfoot is always last. And be willing to accept only the facts. Don't put emotion into it. And the last thing. Pro proof is truth. Don't lead your research with emotion. It may only lead you down the road of fallacies. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up here, and I appreciate everything, and if you want to come and visit with me, I appreciate you, and have a great time. Thank you. Shelly Covington, Montana, right there.